Now, Pete, let's move from that now to the other thing you were vitally interested in for amusement, which was boxing and wrestling and so on. Yes. Tell well, us something about that. Well, in those days, uh, the cars were limited. We had very little automobiles, and uh, we had no radios at that time, and we had no television. So we had to, our entertainment was largely self-made. Yeah. But the, we went into the sports. And in those days, soccer football was a, was a very outstanding sport, and uh, we had some outstanding teams in the city of St. Thomas. And we played to very, we played to very large crowds. And uh, we, uh, we played in the London circuit, and we brought in various teams from uh, around Ontario. I was playing with a, a junior team at first, under 21, called the Junior Rovers. And we established a Canadian record. We we played 84 games without a single defeat. Now that was an outstanding because we had played we played teams. We won our our league, which was the London and District League. We won that for three years in a row, and uh, we won the Briscoe and the Gird Challenge Cups. We won all the Challenge Cups in the district. In fact, we retained all the Challenge Cups. That at that time. Then we went into the Ontario Cup and we played Toronto and Hamilton and Brantford and uh, some of the other larger centres. We never won the Ontario Cup, but we made a good showing. Well, Pete, would this team be sort of the ancestor of the Yellow Jackets, the famous Yellow Jackets? Well, of course, uh, the, they the, developed later. The Yellow Jackets uh, came in about the same time. But they were uh, rugby football. They oh, were football. You were team. playing. You're we not were just, soccer. just soccer. We were soccer. Oh. Then, of course, uh, right after the First World War, after 19 and 19, the the men of the armies, the Inter-Allied forces, came back, and they had conducted boxing and wrestling trials in the in the forces. Yeah. And these old champions of the services came back and. Uh, I was a young man in those days, and of course I started to take boxing and wrestling. So we used to meet these uh, tough old uh, servicemen who came out of the army, and uh, they provided uh, stiff opposition for us. So we used to fight in the, we used to box in the uh, military, military district number one, which took in Windsor and Sarnia and all of southwestern Ontario. and. Uh, we used to meet all the different uh, men from the different regiments. In those days, uh, I used to fight under the Elgin Regiment, and uh, we then we went into wrestling. What uh, weight classification were you fighting in? Well, now? I was in 120. I, I won the Ontario Wrestling Championship in 19 and 23, and I weighed 123 pounds. Now, who who uh, who coached you in wrestling? Well, <laughs> it's uh, peculiar enough. The man, the first man whom I wrestled with was Lorne W. Galloway. He was the father of Harold Galloway, who is now on our Board of Education, and Ross Galloway, who is, was uh, a boxer in his day at the same time I was. And uh, Ross Galloway, I might say, beat the champion of the world, Lefty Gwynn, who was champion in those days, who won the championship at the Olympic Games in Los Angeles. Ross Galloway beat him five times. And that was he in 1932, that, that Olympics that in Los was, Angeles. Uh, that was it? in the early, yes. And, uh, but then, I, as I say, I wrestled uh, at 123 pounds. That was the Olympic uh, featherweight, yeah. uh, bantamweight weight at that time. And so I, I wrestled in the Canadian trial, Canadian championships and uh, Olympic championships. And, uh, did none, none of those uh, wrestlers at that time uh, represented Canada in any of the Olympic Games? Oh, yes. Yeah. Oh, yes. The, the man that I wrestled that beat me in Winnipeg in 1923 for the Dominion. And in those days, we wrestled 10 minutes. And then we had a minute's rest, and we wrestled another 10 minutes. Yeah. After 20 minutes, Jim Trivanov, who now lives in Winnipeg, and who is in the Canadian uh, Hall of Fame, because after beating me, he won the Canadian Wrestling Championship ten years in a row. Did he really? And he was champ. He was the captain of the Canadian wrestling team 
they took the Canadian wrestlers over to the Olympic Games. Now Trivenov went to the Olympic Games, but he never won a medal. He never won a he never won a, a bronze. That's even a bronze. Uh, pretty tough competition oh, tough when you get on a world level, isn't yes, it? Yes, yes. Well, I think the two things that are interesting about that, Pete, are the fact that St. Thomas had such good soccer teams, yeah. and then for 40 years we've had no soccer. Now it's coming back very strongly, becoming a very popular game again. Yes, it is. And yes. also, uh, I think some of the high schools now are doing quite a bit of wrestling. And, yes, they uh, are. It's become a very prominent high school sport. That, that's right. Well, now, Pete, we got to move on. You can't spend all your life there having a good time and wrestling and... Eating that pie and ice bumps, cream and the bumps. <laughs> riding the bobtail streetcars. <clears throat> when did you get married and who did you marry? Well, I married a girl down in the church. I mm -hmm. met in the church. Uh, her name was Annie Murray, a very fine girl. And we've been married for 47 years, mm -hmm. looking forward to our, to our 50 years, yeah. hoping that we'll be spared. We married. We were married in 1928. Just a year before the Depression. That was the year before uh, the Depression. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, um, where did you live when you got married? Well, I, I lived down, uh, I, my people lived on uh, Trafalgar Street, and uh, my wife's people lived on uh, Arthur Avenue. And uh, we were going to be married on, our, on the, their anniversary, but uh, her father died uh, rather suddenly, unexpectedly. So we were married in July 1928 and uh, rather earlier than we thought. Yeah. Well, then you just uh, be married in uh, 1929, the stock market collapsed and we had the depression That's and then right. we had the period banks, that... Uh, banks closed the United States. <laughs> yeah. We had the period of uh, depression in the 1930s and layoffs. Could you tell us something about working conditions on the railroad then? Well, of course, in those days, the railroads were the predominant industry in St. Thomas. There was very few, just a few other secondary industries, but the, the majority of people who were in St. Thomas, it was called the Railroad City. And we had six railroads running out in and out of St. Thomas. And uh, as I say, when you, when you came to St. Thomas, you worked on the railroad, so that it was the predominant industry here. And then, of course, the railroads would be hurt the same as everything else. The, Industries yeah. weren't, uh, freight was down, passenger traffic was down. So what, what were conditions like well, for working and making a living? And they laid a lot of men off. Yeah. And then, of course, they, uh, they shut down. They would shut down for probably two or three months, maybe. And uh, I know there's some years there we didn't work. There was three years that at uh, Christmas time we didn't work at all. No. We didn't work in the month of December at all. And uh, so that, you see, we talk today of 6% uh, unemployment as a, as a very drastic figure. But in those days it went to 25 and 30%. Yeah. You see, about one third of the working forces of Canada were unemployed. The economic machinery stalled and things came to a stop. Well, Pete, uh, this is uh, interesting that uh, it, a lot of the viewers will remember the Depression because like you and I, they lived through it. Uh, but um, uh, to young people today uh, who have unemployment insurance and uh, various kinds of benefits, I think we'll have to explain uh, to our younger viewers that in the 1930s there was no unemployment insurance. There was no uh, unemployment insurance, no family allowances, uh, no social services of any kind. You now, could get a pension at 70. There was you? an old age pension at 70 years of age, and that was $20 a month. <laughs> and uh, that was all that you had. You had yeah. to go to 70 to get an old age pension. Well, then, Pete, I think as a result of the Depression, would, would you agree with me here that as a result of the Depression and your sort of uh, strong... Uh, uh, leanings towards helping the unfortunate that you went into politics. Well, yes, it, uh, it was through the Depression years, of course, uh, there was a tremendous amount of people on relief. Now, we didn't call it welfare in those days. It was relief. And that's what it meant. It was simply a stopgap until you got a job. You, the, the, the municipality helped you until you, uh, until you got a job. So it was a relief measure, an emergency measure. 
I, uh, in 1933, I ran in the election of 1933 and was elected to the city council. That was my first uh, try at municipal politics. Well, uh, Pete, I, I don't want to, uh, I want to go back because you were telling me before when we were talking <coughs> that uh, uh, you, a delegation asked you to run. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, it was rather, uh, I had no thought of entering uh, municipal politics at all. And uh, it was surprising one night that I had a delegation of men from the East End come into uh, Arthur Avenue, my Arthur Avenue home there. And uh, there was Jack Scram, who all these men are dead and gone now. Yeah, but let's but have some would, of their names. The older people would remember them. Uh, there was Jack Scram, who had a, a service station down in that area. There was Max Cullman, who was a junk man, a very, very fine man. His son, Gordon Cullman, is running the, the Cullman junkyard to this day. There was uh, old uh, Tanner, what was his first name? Uh, he was a, a dray man, had a horse and dray, and uh, brought in supplies and uh, to the Canada Iron Foundry. There was Bill Mason, another moving. He was a dray man, a mover. And uh, these men came round to the house one night. And out of a clear blue sky, they asked me to if I would run as alderman to represent the east end of the city. And uh, at first, I, I thought they were trying to pull my leg, but however, they were very serious. At the same time, <coughs> they had gone to a fellow who lived farther up the street on Arthur Avenue, Ernie Duckworth. And Ernie and I worked in the railroad shops together and they had approached him. So when we went to work the next day, Ernie said to me, did you have a delegation visit you? And I said, yes. He said, what do you think of it? Well, I kind of laughed. I said, what did you think of it? Well, he said, I'll tell you. He said, if you'll run, I'll run. And that's the way <laughs> that, it was. That's how we get into politics. Well, now, in that election of uh, 1933, uh, all the old council were turned out. Uh, the mayor kept his seat, but all the uh, aldermen were new aldermen. The whole council was wiped out, and every man that was elected was a new man, with the exception of Angus Johnson,